if you have your Bibles, be finding the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, as we continue this theme of outreach for this week. I believe God wants us to turn outward and to reach out to some people, hurting people, struggling people. Some are Christians, some are not. He gave us a command to go into all the world and preach the gospel in Matthew 28. He gave us symbols of outreach. He said to, that you're the light of the world in Matthew 5. Light, as you know, goes outward. He said you're the salt of the earth. Salt, it has, if it's going to do any good, it's got to come out of the salt shaker. He's com- compared us to sowing seed. You've got to get the seed out of the satchel and sow it into the ground. Everything about God is outreach. God sent His Son. That's the core of the Christian faith. Jesus, the Son, sent His disciples, the twelve, making them apostles. And the early church sent Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13. Why do we, why are we sent? Why do we go? Why do we do outreach? Why care? Because people are much like this paralytic. Let's begin in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. He returned to Capernaum after some days and it was reported that he was at home or in, at, at a house. And many gathered together, so there was no more room even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. They came bringing a paralytic. There are people who cannot come unless they're brought. This paralytic and this this story, I think, illustrates that. They are bound in their sin, their chains. John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me unless the Father draws him. And an interesting verse Paul writes to a pastor in 2 Timothy 2, 24 He says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone and able to teach, correcting opponents with gentleness, for perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading to the truth. Now notice this, that they may escape the snare of, of the devil having been captured by him. Why is outreach so difficult? Why is it a struggle? Why do we a lot of times end up disappointed? We invite them. Sometimes they even say yes, and then they don't come. It is spiritual warfare. They are snared by the devil, captured. So keep that in mind this week. As we invite people, as we send out letters to people inviting them, you'll have somebody's name on your heart and you'll want them to come. The first and best thing you can do is to pray for them. Pray God give you wisdom for them so that your efforts are successful because only God can set them free. Perhaps, he says, God will grant them repentance to a knowledge of the truth. Perhaps He will. So we make our effort, every effort, recognizing that there is a snare of the devil they are captured by. So we are going out, not just to invite people this week, but we are going out to encounter and engage our invisible enemy who's captured hearts and minds. This paralytic kind of represents those people. 
He could not come unless He was brought. And so we're sent because people don't just show up. They have to be invited. They have to be encouraged. They have to be motivated. Now you notice in Mark chapter 2, verse 2, it says it was reported that Jesus was in the house and preaching the word to them. It was reported. Here was an opportunity for people to come and hear Jesus teach. Uh, Next Sunday morning, I'm going to bring a message that is the very words of Jesus. It's going to be a message about Jesus from Jesus. I, I mean, it'd be good if we could say Jesus is going to be here next Sunday to teach. Notice that in verse 2. He was preaching the Word to them. Well, I'm going to try to re- get as close to that as possible by saying, by teaching and preaching the very words of Jesus about coming to God next Sunday morning. Obviously, I won't be Jesus, but I can give you His words. This was an opportunity for people to hear His words. And so they brought this paralytic man. Not only was it an opportunity for the man himself, but it was an opportunity to express their faith. Look at uh, verse 4. They could not get near Him, that is Jesus, because of the crowd. So they removed the roof above him, and when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Notice that he saw their faith. So I'm going to ask you to go out in faith. What did he see? Well, Faith is persistence. It's trusting in God when it doesn't look like it's going to mean anything. They had to cross some distance. Uh, There were no ambulances or uh, vans to bring him, so they had to carry him. Probably each one got a corner of the blanket that carried him. They got to the house and the crowd was so large they couldn't get in. At that point, they could have said, well, we just had to turn around and go back. But they didn't. They got up on the roof. And roofs in those days were made, especially in Capernaum, it was near the Galilee, Lake Sea of Galilee. They would make these uh, tiles. They'd where they'd cut it out from the mud and then bake it in the sun and add certain materials to it. It was really pretty ingenious the way they would do it, much like tiles on a house today. And they made these tiles so they had to take off the tiles in the spot where they thought Jesus would be. And I'm sure as they're taking off these tiles, somebody said, hey, what are you guys doing? Who's going to pay for this? So they had to remove these hardened tiles. They had to explain what they were doing and probably pay for the damages. Obstacles to be overcome. When Jesus saw their determination and their faith and their faithfulness and their persistence, He said to this man dangling now in front of Him, Son, your sins be forgiven you. So let's go in faith this week. And let's fill this place up next Sunday morning with worshiping people. Here's an opportunity. We get an extra hour of sleep. There's a, anything that will be an argument. I'll take you out to eat. Others are coming. We're going to be ready. All barrels loaded next Sunday morning. I told Bud, I said, I want you to bring your A game. 
Not like you did yesterday in football, but, to, but on Sunday morning, that's when I want you to do it. Opportunities for the paralytic, opportunities to grow in faith, but also an opportunity for Jesus' authority to be revealed. Look at verse 5. And when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes sitting there, questioning in their hearts, said, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? If I had been sitting there, I think I would have probably said the same thing. Who, how can he forgive sins? That's God's prerogative. Sin is a debt it's, you have to, that has to be paid. So I, just like I couldn't pronounce your mortgage debt canceled, right? If I said, hey, uh, I just want to let you know your mortgage is canceled. Well, your bank might have something to say about that. Why? Because they have the mortgage. You owe them, not me. But Jesus pronounces him forgiven and their objection is very, very valid. How, how can he, this is blasphemy. How can he forgive sins? Only God can do that. Unless, what? He is God <laughs> in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. But it's more than that even. Remember that in this first century setting, it is true only God can forgive sins, but they imply that what they're meaning by that is that takes place at the temple in Jerusalem, not up here in Capernaum. If you want your sins forgiven, what do you do? You take a lamb, the sacrifice, you go down to the temple in Jerusalem where God dwells, and you give the sacrifice to the priest, the tribe of Levi, those are the three non-negotiables. You can't just go out and ask God to forgive you. And nobody certainly can pronounce you forgiven. But Jesus inserts himself into the role of the entire mosaic process of forgiveness. The re whole redemptive work of the Old Covenant. He takes upon Himself to be the high priest. Hebrews 8.1 We have such a high priest who is at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. He's our high priest. He takes upon Himself the role of the sacrifice. John 1.29 John the Baptist said, Jesus, behold, there's the Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the world. He inserts Himself into the role of the whole temple. I don't think we'll have this on the screen, but I have this down to give to you. Listen carefully at this. John 2, 18. The Jews said, what sign would you show us? And Jesus said, John 2, 19, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. In verse 21, he was referring to the temple of his body. Whoa. So Jesus is saying, I'm taking the place of the temple, the sacrificial system, and the legitimacy of the priesthood, and I am replacing that entire system. And, and I myself will pronounce you up here in Capernaum, away from the temple, without a sacrifice and without a priest, I will pronounce you forgiven. I will absolve you of all of your sins. That is awesome. That calls for a new covenant. The old covenant couldn't do that.
So here is Jesus, God in the flesh, elevating himself to the place of the entire sacrificial system with its priesthood and the atoning work of the temple, bringing forgiveness to this man. And let me say something here about uh, forgiveness. You know, if you were this man, this paralytic, and they're carrying you, what, what do you got in mind? What do these men have in mind? They have in mind, if I'm not mistaken, that Jesus might heal this man. That he would say, stand up and walk. But what does Jesus do? He says, son, when he saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Is that a bit of a letdown? <laughs> you know? Wait, I, I need to walk. No, Jesus would say, what you need is forgiveness of your sin. That is your deepest need is forgiveness. You can walk in the resurrection. It's interesting to me that Jesus put a priority on the man's deepest need. It was so deep, he didn't even know he had that need. He didn't even know that was his greatest need. And I want to tell you that when we invite people this week, we bring them in next Sunday, I am going to invite them to be forgiven for their sins. Their deepest need can be met. Nothing is worse than guilt on the human personality. Martin Luther in the 16th century in the Protestant Reformation left behind a lot of the Roman Catholic rituals and liturgies and pilgrimages and all the things to do to get forgiveness. And the Protestant Reformation took off. But one thing Luther kept out in the Roman, that the Roman Catholic Church had, he kept the confessional. Because he said, men need constant reminders of forgiveness. They need to be assured of being forgiven continually. And I was reminded of that some time ago when I was looking at 1 John 1, 9. And I heard a pastor bring out an interesting point here. First uh, John 1, 9. Do, you, do we have that one? You're probably familiar with this, but it, it was a blessing to me to, to see that the word confess, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That the word confess is in that continual tense in the Greek text. If we continually confess our sins. Because who among us has not thought, oh man, I blew it again. I've sinned again. Same old sin. How will, when will this ever stop? And we get, Satan uses it on us to keep us from worship and coming to God and praying for other things and walking with Him. He keeps reminding us again and again. But here's what the text says. If we continually confess or acknowledge our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive. Now there He goes back to the aorist tense. That, that each and every moment, each sin, and cleanse us from to cleanse each and every moment from all unrighteousness. He's saying, if you just keep confessing, when you sin, don't let it get you down. Just confess that to God, put it before His grace, before His throne of grace, and He's faithful and just that He will forgive each and every instance in which you sin. If it's 70 times 7, then God will still forgive it 
if we will acknowledge it and confess it as sin. That's a wonderful promise. And I'll be honest with you, I got in on it this week. I probably should have got in on it this morning before I came to church. And I'll probably have to get in on it again tomorrow morning. But what a wonderful promise that God will forgive us, cleanse us, so that we don't have to wallow in remorse and guilt. So here was an opportunity for people to have their deepest needs met, for faith to grow, for Jesus' authority to be revealed, or authority to forgive sin. One other thing, look at verse 12. It was an opportunity for God to be glorified. He rose, verse 12, and picked up his bed and went out before them all. So they were all amazed and they glorified God. See, what Jesus did here is he, he said, I know your hearts. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that that's not something that can be done. A person can't forgive somebody. And Jesus said, well, what do you think is harder? To simply pronounce someone forgiven or to prove it by healing their body. They still didn't say anything. And here's what Jesus said. So you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to this man, take up your bed and walk. In other words, he put the inner healing and the outer healing together. So they reflect each other. That's what God will do in our resurrection bodies. He will take, make the outer man to be just like the inner man. And because anybody can say, hey, um, I forgive you for your sins. Your sins are forgiven. You're absolved. But who can make a paraplegic get out of his bed, fold it up, and walk out in front of everybody? And Jesus said, that's proof that the other one is true. Jesus was revealed as one with authority to forgive sin. And you know what they did? They went out and they said, glory to God. Who can do this but God? So that's what I'm asking that we do this week. That we set the stage for forgiveness of sin the effects of it to follow and that we give glory to God that Psalm 29 verse 1 and 2 ascribe to the Lord O mighty ones ascribe glory and strength give to the Lord the glory due His name it, He is due glory there is something in every Christian that says I want God to be glorified I don't want a weak, stumbling church. I want a powerful, praising, uh, redemptive church in the midst of this society. Where if, if this nation ever needed anything, it is the gospel message today. Let's turn outward. And I'll close with this. I imagine it was far enough the distance, the difficulty, it was far enough that someone, one of the men might have had the idea to take him, but it was going to be too far to carry him. So he, he got a friend. Help me bring my paralytic friend to Jesus. But they said, man, that's still too far. We need two more people, one on each side with him in a blanket and... And I can hear this friend saying, okay, get your edge of the blanket. I'll get my edge of the blanket and we'll get this man.
to where the words of Jesus are being preached. My message, in fact, I want this to be the title, Marcus, Get Your Edge of the Blanket. And I'm asking you, get your edge of the blanket and let's move cooperatively to get people to the words of Jesus next Sunday morning. Can I get an amen, church? Are you with me? We're going to do it this week. We'll do emails. We'll do messages. We'll do flyers. We'll do letters. We'll do phone calls. Every available means. We'll do whatever it takes to reach new people. Somebody's name has come to your mind today. Who can I bring? We're going to meet and pray Saturday night at 8 p.m. You're welcome to join us. We're going to pray that God will release these people from the snare of the enemy. And we'll see victory next Sunday morning.